Almost everyone has at least one relationship with one financial institution. Practically all businesses, regardless of industry, require financial services at some point in time, be it credit cards, bank and time deposits, loans, insurance, or investments. But financials go beyond these. It evolves through technology, and rapid innovation has given birth to a long-term trend called fintech or financial technology. Fintech is a powerful trend. Electronic payments are steadily growing with a lot of room to grow exponentially. On top of this, we also have the rise of cryptocurrency and other blockchain technologies. With the Atrium Global Financials Feeder Fund, investors can participate in growth of companies around the world that are involved with providing financial services. The fund gives you access and diversification to global financial names that we normally do not have locally. The fund also invests in fintech, which a normal financials fund would not. Invest in the biggest global companies in the financial industry. Participate in the global recovery. Diversify your investment portfolio by investing in this fund. Invest in the Atram Global Financials Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. The world around us is ever-changing. We are facing development challenges on a global scale. Today, 41 million out of 57 million deaths are attributable to non-communicable diseases. In the Philippines, 5 out of 10 families were deprived of basic education. The Philippines also ranked third in the top 10 countries with the most natural disasters. Women participation in the labor force is less than half at 48%, while male participation is at 77%. The United Nations identified and adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs to address the challenges faced by economies, societies, and the environment. We at ATRAM support the UN and the SDGs by launching the ATRAM Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. The fund is designed to invest in Philippine companies that score high in terms of the integration of UN SDGs into their operations and strategy. Through this fund, we hope to encourage PSC-listed companies to integrate UN SDGs into their businesses. We must work together to make the world a better place. Atram Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. Invest in a sustainable future together. Invest to thrive. Invest together. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. Megatrends are shaping and influencing the global economy. Urbanization, technological innovation, resource scarcity, and demographic and social change. The long-term shifts in these trends create multiple investment opportunities. They gave rise to a new type of investing called thematic investing. Enter the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. The fund invests into the themes that would benefit the most today making it the first global multi-thematic fund in the Philippine market. Unlike traditional investing, thematic investing is not constrained to sectors or locations, focusing instead on themes and megatrends. It distills the megatrends to find relevant topics that work in this current market environment. It finds the next big thing and invests in it at a very early stage. With this multi-theme fund, investors will have exposure to various companies that will drive future market growth. What's more, you can invest in all the new developments in this world in Philippine peso or US dollar, making it accessible to everyone. Invest in the fund that invests in the stories of tomorrow, today. Invest in the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atrium.com.ph. Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining this week's episode of Atram Webinar Series. I am JP Chong, Business Development Manager, and I will be your host for today. Today's session is dedicated to Atram's Top Performing Unit Investment Trust Funds, or UITFs, of 2021. Stay tuned to learn more about these funds and how Atram's experts navigated the volatile market to achieve these returns. If you have any questions, you may send them as early as now by clicking on the Q&A button found below your screen. Before we begin, I'd like everyone to know that, that this session will be recorded and that the copies will be disseminated as well as posted on all our social media platforms. Also, please do not forget to visit our website. That's 
atram.com.ph for a more detailed information about all the funds that we offer. If you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unable to attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session. And of course, visit our YouTube channel, that's Atrum Studio. Please scan the QR code to visit our official social media pages. Maybe we can give our audience a few seconds to whip up their phones and scan the QR code found on their screens. Also, I'd like to invite you all to join Atrum's official Viber community group. That's hashtag AtramPHCommunity to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. You may do so by scanning the QR code or visit the link on your screen and get, and get a chance to win Atrum merchandise. We'd like this webinar to be as interactive as possible, so please do not hesitate to send in your questions in the Q&A tab all throughout the webinar. Each question you send is a raffle entry for a chance to win limited Atrium merchandise. Winners will be announced at the end of the webinar, so make sure to stay until the very end. We'll be wrapping up also with a quick feedback survey after the webinar, so we do hope you can share your thoughts with us about our session for today and how we can further improve our webinar series. With those out of the way, allow me to briefly introduce our speakers for this morning. Our first speaker is Kyla Torres, Investment Fund Specialist for Atrum's Multi-Asset Team. Kyla oversees investment due diligence, analysis, and monitoring of the target funds of Atrum's range of feeder fund offerings. Kyla graduated from the Ateneo de Manila University in 2014 with a, with a bachelor's degree in management economics. Also joining us today is Atrium's sustainability research associate, Miguel de la Cruz. Migs graduated in 2019 from BS Management Engineering with a minor in developmental management. He previously worked as an associate in the business for sustainable development working for various corporations on improving sustainability outcomes and operations. Now that we have introduced the members of Atrium's proficient and experienced team, we'll now begin with today's discussion by taking a look at the performance of the Atrium funds last year, their ranking against the benchmark, and of course, other peers. Hi, uh, hello there, Kyla and Megs. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. How are you both today in this fine Thursday morning? Good morning. I'm good. I'm good. Hope you are too. Good. How about you, Megs? How are you? How are you this morning? Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, our webinar. I'm doing okay. I'm just at home. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, of course, we, uh, I think the three of us are all yeah, sa safely working in our own home. So uh, yeah. with that... Yeah. Um, I'm sure our viewers right now are very excited to learn more and have key takeaways from our session. So with that, first on our list, let us discuss the Atrum Global Financial Speeder Fund, which has generated a whopping 21.88% and holds the number four spot in thematic peso equity fund for the, for the one-year category in the Philippines. At this point, we have Kyla here right now to explain more about the fund and its, and its strategies. Uh, again, hello there, Kyla. Of course, we just have a couple of questions for you. I, I know our viewers are very excited to learn more about uh, the fund itself. So let me start off by asking, how was the fund allocated last year? Um, it generated a whopping 21.88%. And where is it positioned now? Hi. Um, so maybe if you would look at the beginning of the, of the year, it would have um, weighted more on the fintech side. As you know, everyone was stuck at home, so everyone needed to make their transactions online. But now looking at 2022, most of the weights are now on U.S. or European banks or U.S. life insurers and consumer finance. So why these? Um, so these in general would benefit higher rates, and that's where our macro environment is right now. And... For those, um, just to explain more plainly, is that, for example, if you get a loan, there's an interest rate involved in this. And that's, that interest rate is actually the revenue for these financial institutions. 
So when the rates go higher, that means it would be more profitable for those institutions. But of course, they're still invested in fintech as they see that there's still so much more room for growth in this. And so when you think about fintech, that would be more of like the payment sector again. And they like this because it's less cyclical. So an example for this, just so um, people would understand, is that in a local setting, fintech would be more like Gcash or Seedbox, or when you think about payments using your QR codes. So this would be less cyclical in nature because um, it would be less sensitive to interest rates. So for example, you are, you're still stuck at home and you wanted to buy something online. Whether the interest rate is high or not, but you need that product, you need to transfer funds from your account to the businesses. So um, whether or not you would still need to use that um, as a fi- for that financial, fin- financial transaction. Now, in terms of geography, um, there's still underweight China, um, just trying to reduce the risk as there's still more lockdowns here versus the US and there's still more regulations as well. And long term, they're still bullish on emerging markets as there's still a good opportunity um, for the underbanked here as a lot of people still don't have relations to financial institutions. So an an example of an emerging market is the Philippines, our country. Um, You would think that um, there's still a lot of people that actually don't have a bank account yet or don't have access. So one reason for this is people are still actually intimidated to go inside banks. So there's still more room for growth for this. So in summary, um, how they would be, be positioned is like, Um, They would first consider cheap valuations. Again, they would also take advantage of the rising rates. So that's good for revenues. And they still like growth in terms of technology and and untapped markets. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kayla. I liked it that you touched that. You started with the beginning of this year, uh, the the year of 2021, where all of us are stuck in our own homes. Of course, we want to be safe from the current pandemic. And with that, the fintech was on the rise on that one while we're doing our online payments as you've mentioned a few a few names such as uh gcash and cbox also just to uh, echo in on what you've mentioned that where are we positioned right now you mentioned uh you touch base on the loans of revenues from banks of course that's where banks generate uh, uh some of its revenues or income and and also to echo in you mentioned that fin- there we have still positions on fintech which has still room, more room for growth, if you will, as these are non, you're considered non-cyclical cyclical stocks. And I think this is, I think, a new norm for us that right now, pre-pandemic, I would usually pay by cash. You know, you have your own cash in your wallets, but right now, since the rampant um, uh, growth of the fintech space, we're now paying, if not bank transfer, online transfer, we're paying uh, through, and of course, for example, a QR code. So again, thank you very much for that one. And let's proceed to the next question. Um, please do share with us. I know you touched base a little bit of this one, but see more color into this one. Please do share with us the strategy that what really sets our fund apart from other global equity funds out there. Okay, so an advantage for this fund actually is the company selection. So they really do deep dives for the companies and they also look at relative valuation. So meaning would this, this would actually provide investors as a margin of safety as they would look for cheaper options or cheaper investments, but that would still offer good value. But why financials in the first place? So just investing in this fund, you would already be diversing diversifying your investment as it would be um, a mix of traditional finance and also technology or innovations in finance. And also, again, it really benefits the current macro environment as we now have a shift in the economic cycle. And also, again, um, going back to the valuation, so relatively compared to other sectors, the, this sector is still trading cheap. So it's around forward fees, around 12 times versus 17 times in the world index. So if you would say naka discount po siya yung sector na to, pero it would it's really going to benefit with in the revenue side um, this year. And again, there's an element of growth because there's still huge untapped markets that um, that 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 we could still bank on for this fund. All right, thanks for that, Kayla. Of um, of course, you mentioned it's it's a mix of traditional and what we know right now the non-traditional or the, the fintech part of the financial space. 
And of course, because of that shift of the economic cycle. Uh, for the next question, I know you touched base on loans. Just a brief overview of it, but we'd like to ask for more color. What's your view on non-performing loans in the banking sector? Of course, given to the given of the current pandemic that we're currently experiencing. All right. So, well, in the gen in general, the, for the pandemic, a lot of businesses closed down. I, I think you could see that maybe if you tried going out to the malls, a lot of stores shut. So that actually means that maybe if these businesses would have borrowed money from banks to to launch their businesses, they might have been delayed in paying their loans back. But now, as we see that the health situation is be getting better, although we saw a rise in cases for Omicron this January, and now we are seeing the cases go back down. That means um, this year we would see an improvement in MPLs as, um, as more businesses would have actually more confidence to open up again. They'll have more confidence because the people will have more confidence, confidence to go back. They'll, be, they'll feel safer and... Uh, they might start actually borrowing again. And on the NPL side, that's also good because um, they'll be able to do business again. And when that, that means that the, they will have more capacity to pay to pay back their loans. Right. Thank you very much for that, Kayla. And yes, I do agree with you that we started off this year, especially in the first month of the year, January, there has been a rise of the, uh, of the cases of the Omicron variant here in the Philippines. But as we go along further this year, it slowly disap uh, um, uh, dissipates. And of course, um, that is a good sign for our economy that we're slowly but surely um, opening it up. And hopefully the businesses will come in, um, capital uh, influx uh, will come in here in our economy right now. Um, really good stuff. Um, for the last one, before I let you go and call you back again for the later part of the discussion, which is a question right we have right here, right now, and it's one of the um, very popular questions out there. Um, does the fund have investments in cryptocurrency? Great. Thank you for that question. Um, currently, the fund isn't exactly directly invested in cryptocurrency, but what it likes is more of the infrastructure of, of currency, uh, cryptocurrency. So, for example, they would like companies that do offer on-ramping crypto. So, that means... Um, these are the companies that convert crypto to and from fiat currencies. Or let's say you have pesos or dollars, but you want to buy crypto. So you need a way to um, convert these. And th that's the kind of um, investments this fund is looking at. Now, in terms of blockchain technology, they see opportunity here in the world of payments. Again, securities, custody, and settlement. But because this, this, this world of cryptocurrency is still rather new to the world of um, of financials. This is still um, a small portion of the portfolio, less than around 5%. But uh, also, one reason why they're not so invested in this yet is because, again, they prioritize good valuations or margin of safety. And some crypto sub-themes are still rather expensive and won't fit that, that criteria. So again, it, we're, we're getting protected on the risk side also as well um, for that. All right. Thank you very much for that, Kela. That provides more clarity on the burning question that we usually get received. We receive actually uh, when it uh, relative to this fund in terms of the cryptocurrency space. So again, we do not really direct invest in cryptos, but we uh, have um, th those companies that are related to crypto. Uh, so thank you for that, Kela. We'll just uh, call you back uh, for the next segment. So moving on to the next best performing new ITF on our list is the Ashram Philippines Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. The fund ranked uh, number five in the thematic peso equity fund in the Philippines and has generated a 20.60% return. The Ashram Philippines Sustainable Development and Growth Fund is designed to achieve capital growth by investing locally in equities of companies whose products and services are considered by the investment manager as contributing to positive environmental or social change, thereby making an impact on the sustainable development and growth of our economy. So with that, let me call on back Migs de la Cruz to explain more about the fund and the strategies. So hi there. Hello there again, Migs. It has been a while since our last webinar. I think it I was a week or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, or thereabouts. Yes. Oh my, yeah, thereabouts. <laughs> yes. 
Of course, just our, uh, just like our last webinar, we have a couple of questions for you. So our viewers, I'm sure, are very interested to know. Um, so let me keep the ball rolling by asking. Same goes. Same question with Kay uh, with Kyla. Can you share the strategy with us and what really sets the fund apart from other equity funds? Thanks, JP. I have slides for this. No, I just wanted to, to make it clear to everyone. So the SDGF strategy it does have three objectives. So the first is to drive better than market returns, right? So the thesis for the strategy really is that integrating sustainable development goals and sustainability in general into the operations and strategy of a company is an investment that pays better returns in the long term. And companies who do so will be valued at a premium to peers, right? So contingent to that noise, that it's focused on the long run, long run, long term, really. A push for SDG integration is to encourage Philippine businesses to view the business in a horizon that's beyond the three-year, five-year business plan. And it looks out for the next generation, essentially. Um, and also contingent to that is uh, the goal to create a broader impact, right? So through allocation of capital, the fund aims to motivate Philippine companies to invest in the continuous integration of sustainability into the strategies and operations, and to include communities and the environment as stakeholders. All right. Thank you very much for that, Miguel. So with that, um, we, we promote the inclusion, that inclusion aspect, um, which Miguel has mentioned. So following it up, can you share with us the driver of the allocation of the fund? So it's more of the allocation of the fund itself. Yeah, so it's a little different now from, from other equity strategies, right? So if you go to the, ne the next slide, um, first of all, it, it's unique. It's a unique strategy that uses a sustainability framework that we use through a scoring process, looking at different reports to offer robust returns. And we think it can do so in the long run. So far, uh, we see that this uses a good stock selection process and it has had a good batting average over the first year. I mean, we're top five right now for a reason. Um, most funds, no, most equity funds use financial statements, corporate updates, uh, news, but, you know, we also use data, but we use specifically data that a company, that indicates what a company tries to do for itself, its people, its customers, the environment, its suppliers, and other stakeholders, you know, so we're not just interested in prices, but we're interested in how they integrate sustainability with different stakeholders. And to make it clear also, no, uh, the SDGs also illustrate the ability to create value, right? So this, we see that sort of uh, playing out in different SDGs, right? So the SDG on providing decent work and economic growth and those that help with providing education and health benefits also help with productivity and can positively impact your top line. Investing in R&D, innovation can increase efficiencies, uh, increasing your efficiencies in energy and water use also help cost-wise. So these do have linkages to the creation of value. And that value is what our framework aims to capture. And so far, it, it's working. I mean, uh, looking into these other types of data has managed to help us pick some winners uh, for the SDG fund. Right. Uh, thank you for that, Miguel. Yes, I agree. So far, it's working. Currently, we're at number five <laughs> and it generated around 20.60% return. Really a good feat for the fund. And just like to tackle a little bit, you mentioned um, this fund has a unique strategy in terms of you know, the sustainability framework. And we don't, just don't look at the prices, but more of um, how companies integrate sustainability across different stakeholders. Again, thank you for that, Miguel. So I'll move on to the next question, which is I uh, a question that we got from our audience. It's a really good question. Uh, how are Philippine companies in terms of sustainability integration? So are they comparable to the rest of the region? Um, we've, we've taken steps. That's what I can say. So uh, many companies have already come up with their first sustainability reports, right? So now they're required by the SEC to submit on top of their annual reports, their sustainability reports. But you know, the impetus to make changes is there, but we can certainly do more. Um, we need to incentivize our firms to accelerate the process by which we integrate sustainability. And I think uh, by having this fund means that we're doing our part in this and by bringing awareness. We think investors also have the power to motivate behavior for both firms 
and consumers to change. So we're like we're we're in line, I'd say. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the region to region, there are different. We're differing in uh, progress in terms of sustainability integration, uh, but uh, for sure, we can we can do more. And the fund aims to help in that process. All right, thanks for that, Miguel. Actually, I have a follow up question uh, here. Can you give an example of a stock that has a high score and has also great performance? Of course, um, define what 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 we mean by a high score. Right, so I won't. I I don't have the scores offhand in my head, no. But I I can give one example. Uh, Century Pacific. Again, so just to add, no, we don't discriminate in terms of small mid caps. If you integrate your sustainability in your strategy operations, you're up for inclusion in the fund. Century Pacific has a very high score because um, number one, it's been reporting for quite a while now, so you have a lot of data to go on. Um, and it shows you know, the date, the fact that they're measuring this data and using it as part of their sustainability strategy is a plus for us. But also you see there the that they've managed to continually improve on their water usage, their energy usage, their um, their emissions intensity over the past three years. So it hasn't let up. They've been able to improve on that. So I think that's one of the key indicators. It helped also that they managed to keep employment in check even during the pandemic. Um, they have a lot of initiatives relating to, to waste generation and waste management. Um, and it performed well. I mean, for, for our fund, it's one of the the many one of the many good performers in in the one of the many winners in the fund so i think that's just one example of a company that did well all right thank you for that miguel for giving us a little bit of a tidbit if you will on century yeah. pacific and how they improved and on their on of course on their sustainability approaches in terms of water energy and emission i would that we'll just take uh, this last question in this segment and we'll call you back later for the q and a portion so what kind of due diligence did Atram, of course, us here in Atram, do uh, make sure that these listed companies within the fund support the UN SDG goal? Right, so uh, looking at the objectives now, if you can go back to the previous slide, um, an important part of the objectives is the engagement part, right? So seeing how they can create that impact and allocate capital towards more sustainable activities. And this process is ongoing, actually. This due diligence is ongoing. And we argue also it's long-term because we make sure we conduct due diligence to motivate firm behavior. Um, This long-term engagement is not just with companies that we invest in, but the whole market. It's seeing both the risks and the opportunities and sustainability. this due, due diligence is for, is for sure long-term and it's an ongoing process of engagement. Right. It's really nice to know that we have a long-term view or a long-term, of course, or that due diligence pr- a process that we have here in Atram. So thank you very much for that, Migs. Of course, for sharing to our audience your views and strategies. Uh, personally, um, I learned a lot and I hope that, of course, our viewers or our audience right now sure did uh, have uh, key takeaways uh, in that as well. So again, we will see you again in the Q&A portion. So before we move on to the next fund, I would like to remind our viewers, uh, please do send in your questions using the Q&A tab found below your screen. We are receiving lots of questions right now, and we, as, uh, we will try to tackle them as we go along, and we'll tackle uh, most, if not all, questions in the Q&A portion later in the discussion. So thank you very much for that, everyone. So next up is the Atrium Global Technology Feeder Fund which has generated a massive return of 141.90%. It has ranked number one in thematic peso equity fund for the three-year category and ranked second in the, in the one-year cumulative performance category with a return of 29.97%. Of course, a very imp- uh, impressive performance indeed, 141.90%. So with that, let me call uh, Colin back again here, uh, Kyla, from our multi-asset team to share with us the strategies and, of course, help our audience um, in their investment decisions. So he- hello there again, uh, Kyla. Thank you very much again for joining us. So with that, let me start it off by asking, just like earlier in the earlier part of the discussion, for the benefit of our viewers, can you share with us the driver 
of the allocation of the fund? Hello again. Um, so for the driver, the primary driver of this fund would really be the, the stock selection. Again, so there's a deep dive going into a uh, deep dive in companies um, for this fund. So they do a bottom up approach and um, they ask, looking at those companies, they actually segment them into three sectors. And one would be um, the first one would be growth. So these would be more of the long-term winners and Horizon Prince would be more of a three-year horizon. So an example of this would be Alphabet Al or what you would say Google. So styles in this segment would include cloud computing, internet of things, which means devices that you would, you, you would need the internet for or you would use the internet for, and e-commerce. But again, the, the portfolio manager is conscious about valuations. So they will not overpay for growth. So this, again, is a, it's a margin of safety for investors. So it's kind of contrarian in that sense also. And the second sector is called cyclicals. So this would be driven more by supply and demand opportunities. An example of this is semiconductors. So semiconductors in the tech sector was actually the, the winner um, um, in, in the last year. Um, so because, again, when we... We, when we all went back home, even companies were working from home. Until now, we're still working from home. Schools, they, they also had to study from home. People needed to buy iPads. People needed to buy computers. And these needed the chips or the semiconductors um, that would make these devices work. So um, a holding horizon for this would be typically just a year. And the last segment would be called special situations. So an example would be, let's say they see management improvements in the company. And so maybe this change in management would be good leadership and would be a good opportunity in the companies. But this sector would be... in-depth analysis that they do for these companies. And then they overlay that with external factors that complement these valuations. All right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kyla. I liked it that you touched that in terms of the stock selection on a bottom-up approach, and you discussed um, the three sectors. Um, just, just to name a few, um, growth, you, have, you mentioned Google. Um, for cyclicals, uh, since all of us were um, safely in our own homes during the height of the pandemic, you have your semiconductors. And of course, lastly, though you have the, your special situation. So with that, thank you very much for that, Kayla. And I'll move on to the next question. So you mentioned these companies. So how are the trends, how are these trends decided upon? Does this, does this mean that the fund composition may change drastically at times? Okay, so themes in the portfolio typically don't change dramatically, as many of them are multi-period or long-term trends. So once the themes are identified, um, opportunities will be looked out for in the value chain. and uh, But currently, um, it's more of a long-term period because we're actually still experiencing these trends and they won't change anytime soon. Um, so just like AI, digitization, or gaming, we're still experiencing it now. So, so far, that's, what, um, that's what's going on. But if, you will, if I would highlight a trend right now, let's say 2022, um, that would be automation, electric vehicles, and cloud the cloud. All right, thank you for that, Kayla. So just like uh, just to echo in what Kayla has mentioned relative to the question, these do not change dramatically as uh, it's more of a long term. It's a more of a long term period, and the trends that we experience right now, just to name a few, what Kayla has mentioned, uh, Kayla has mentioned AI, digitization, and of course gaming. Next, of course, thank you for that, Kayla. Uh, for the next question. Um, what is the biggest risk involved in investing with global technology? Of course, as Etram, we're your advisors. We would still have to protect you um, and warn you about the risks involved. And I think I could name three risks that we can look at for the global technology sector. And the first one would be supply chains. But supply chains, this is not specific to the technology sector. All kinds of businesses are affected by the supply chain disruptions. So because... Um, what are supply chain disruptions? It's more because a lot of us are still can still experience lockdowns. There would be um, delays in the manufacturing side. And let's say for hardware devices, you would need all the pieces involved. And that comes from all different places. 
Um, so if there's a delay, you can't make the whole um, product it is itself. But of course, since again, the health situation is getting better, we're, we're seeing that these supply chains would ease over time. And the next would be labor shortages. So in the past pandemic, uh, in the past year, um, there has been a massive resignation or actually in the IT sector itself, there's still a huge gap for, um, I mean, there's still so much room for them to hire more people and there's, there's a shortage of IT people. So let's say for software, for software companies, they still need more engineers as well. And because there are a shortage of people, um, you, you'd want to provide better incentives so you could hire the best talent. And that can also impact some margins. And of course, lastly, the last risk is probably the most popular one right now is the rise in bond yields. But again, this fund is very valuation conscious. So they stick to companies that have strong pricing power or demand and that they would be able to withstand costs. Um, stemming from rising rates. And also some tech companies would be less affected by this because if you compare some tech companies compared to other, let's say, traditional sectors, these are less capex in, uh, intensive. So they would need less loans for you to borrow or make the business happen because um, they, re they rely heavier on cash or they have a bigger pool of cash. So they'd be less um, sensitive to the rise in interest rates. And also the revenues would um, um, would still be carried on again um, due to their pricing power. Like um, they have the, like consumers would still be able or would want to still buy their products despite um, them maybe raising um, their prices. So that's what the company looks like. All right. Thank you very much for that, Kyla. I like that you touched base on the risks. And of course, us here in Atram, you want to share to our, um, of course, investors that we also um, would like to protect you guys from these risks. And Kyla has mentioned three. So these are your supply chain for the first one. And she also mentioned that this is not only isolated in the tech space, but this is also for everyone, uh, for the all across all industries, given that we're currently experiencing the, the, the pandemic. Next is the labor shortages. Kyla touched, uh, touched based on there's still room for growth there, that there is shortage on people, especially in the IT space. And lastly, on, of course, the rise of the bond yields. And Kyla has mentioned that the fund managers are really valuation conscious uh, in terms of uh, the managing the fund. So again, thank you very much for that, Kyla. I hope I was able to give a, a quick brief of what you have explained uh, relative to the question. So for the last question, before we proceed to the Q&A, where, um, where is the fund positioned now? The Atrium Global Technology Feeder Fund had a massive return of 141.90%. And where are we posi positioned now for this fund and where could this take us further? Hi, okay. So I guess in general, January, um, there's there's rather weak sentiment for risky assets, particularly with the technology sector. But investors also should be um, wary in comparing this, what's happening now to the market, compared to what happened to the technology sector in the 90s, in the dot-com burst. So back then, um, technology was still highly unprofitable. Adaptation was not widely skilled. And... Uh, Let's say now, actually, um, people are more sticky now. Can you, in your time of the day, um, what hour, how many, compare the hours you use without technology, without the internet, um, aside from sleeping, okay? Don't count sleeping. Um, we will, we, there is a stickier demand for technology. Almost every activity we do, we, do, um, we do depend on technology. Unlike back then, it was, it was still um, a small portion of our time back then. But now also, again, as demand continues to grow, that will grow on three fronts. So that's the consumer, just like what I mentioned a while ago, our reliance on gadgets are more sticky, corporations and uh, governments. So for corporations, the pandemic has accelerated uh, the need for businesses to be automated. And there are still traditional sectors of the old economy, like manufacturing, that need drastic transformations to be more efficient. 
And governments globally as well have pledges to improve the quality of life of their citizens. So that includes transformation of infrastructure and science. So one example is the U.S. infra program worth $1 trillion, over $1 trillion. So they would need to modernize the likes of airports or updating areas for 5G coverage. And another example, again, would be the sustainability pledges um, led by Europe or countries that plan to reduce carbon emissions, whether it's 2030, 2050, they would need to transform how their economies work and they would need regulations to curb climate change. And in turn, business would have to adapt to that so that they can make those pledges. So an example would be using less oil and transform it to more electricity use. All right. Thank you very much for that, Kayla. Very, very, um, we have lots of questions coming in here right now. So again, um, before we proceed to the Q&A, thank you very much to our audience for sending in, this que- uh, uh, sending in these questions and we will tackle them later on. Again, thank you very much, Kayla. We will see you later during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Right. So there you have it, everyone. Um, Atram Stop Performing UITFs for 2021. But before we proceed to the Q&A portion, we are proud to say that Atram, has a wide range of investment products and our capabilities span across several asset classes meant to service the different investment objectives of each individual. And with these, it was great pride that we announced that ATRAM has achieved a number of industry awards for 2021. The best local fund house in the Philippines given by Asian investor, the best investment solution provider from World Business Outlook, would like to add that Atrum Group and Atrum Wealth received the editor's triple star from the Asset Triple A Sustainable Investing Awards and the Asset Triple A Private Capital Awards, respectively, for integrating ESG, that's environmental, social, and corporate governance in all our investment process. Finally, we want to say that the Atrum Total Return Peso Bond Fund has been recognized by the CFA Society of the Philippines as the best managed fund of the year for peso medium term FVPL valuation category. For today's session, we hope to have somehow assisted you to hashtag take on tomorrow by investing your hard earned money with an award winning fund house. At this point, we'd like to move on to the live questions from our audience. We have several questions coming in and we received lots of questions earlier during the first part of uh, the webinar. So with that, let me invite Kyla and Megs uh, here again to help me address these questions. And we hope to, uh, to provide answers to these questions that would give you key takeaways for this webinar. So hello again, Kyla and Megs. Thank you very much for the time. And we'll now move on to the Q&A portion of the discussion. I hope you two are ready. I am receiving lots of questions here right now. And um, let's tackle it one by one. All right. So the first question is addressed to Kyla. Where will inter- interest rates go given the concerns about inflation? Yes. So um, currently, as we are now moving um, towards um, the pandemic into an endemic, so generally, um, central banks now are trying to do policy normalization. So this is normal because they have... Um, fed in so much ayuda or fiscal programs into um, the economies in the last two years. There's a lot of cash or um, funds going into into the environment. And so that that kind of caused uh, a bit of inflation. And also that that inflation was caused by um, supply chain disruptions. But again, because too much inflation may not be a good thing, so it's actually good that the central banks are doing something about it. And given that, um, the trajectory would be um, to higher interest rates. And now the markets are forecasting about uh, five to six rate hikes um, by year end. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Kyla. Of course, yes, the central banks are hopefully doing something about it. And it's really nice to know that um, we have a direction on where will the interest rates go that would give us our investors right now listening in to our webinar on where can they position their, um, of course, fund. Um, the next question is for Migs. Uh, do you 
think or see if there is a correlation between companies, especially Philippine-listed companies, who follow the UN SDG with their stock performance? Can we say that these companies are compliant with the UN SDGs uh, if they tend to outperform over those companies that are not? Yeah, so um, well, part of the very thesis of the fund you know, is that not just complying with the SDGs, but going above and beyond to be sustainable will drive long-term returns. And as seen in the first year of the fund, this thesis is holding. As I mentioned earlier, no, uh, SDGs and integrating them in strategy do create value in top line and bottom line. So whether that be through increased productivity by taking care of em your employees, climate disaster resilience initiatives that protect against damages and the extensive expenditures that are associated with those things among other good examples. So I think there, there is, you can see anecdotally and also in the very performance of the fund uh, that, this can, that this thesis can hold. All right. Yes, of course. Um, the performance of the fund, especially uh, the, uh, the Atchum Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund that uh, whopping 20.6 return is really uh, evident that uh, the, the strategies are working. Thank you very much for that, Migs. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, I think this one is addressed to me, so I'll just take this one. Among the many funds, um, you have both a new ITF and mutual fund. Aren't they just investing in the same portfolio but different in percentages? Each fund goes up and down and performs differently each year. So investors will be confused on which to place. So can you please give more color or enlighten us with this one? So again, thank you very much for this question. Uh, just to provide more clarity, our, fund, our funds actually, well, uh, all of our funds do not have any overlaps, if you will. They are investment in various asset classes. As you can see, um, uh, Kayla has... Um, presented uh, 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 when explained earlier that there are different sectors that a certain fund is invested on. Same with MIGS, he, um, mostly on the sustainable end. So um, they do not overlap. And not only on the asset classes, uh, maybe on the equities, money market, or fixed income, and across different demo uh, demographics too. You have your, uh, the US, where uh, Kayla has mentioned the alphabet or Google. Um, we um, well, MIGS also explained there are certain uh, Philippine companies here that adhere to the uh, SDG initiatives. Um, if they are the same asset class, the strategy, if, if they are in the same asset class, for example, um, funds are in the same equity class, their strategy would be different. Some would be um, outperforming the benchmark, while some would be on a more thematic structure, such as the SDG or the global technology. So I hope that answered the question. So I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this one is uh, addressed to Kayla. What is your plan? What is your plan or strategy regarding the Global Consumer Feeder Fund? Do you see the NAVPU of the Global Consumer Feeder Fund to go back to the 190 levels? This is uh, this first half of the year. And of course, a follow-up to that, how does the S&P 500 affect this fund? Okay, so there may have been some weakness in this fund lately, but what was the cause of the weakness of that? So this fund is actually, the sources of revenues mainly are from the US and China. Um, so what happened to China last year is that China released a, re a regulatory crackdown, um, especially on the tech side. But why are they doing this in the first place? So technology, there's a lot of monopoly there. And as you know, China is a communist country and they want to level it off or they want it to be more fair for the citizens. So they want to actually transfer some of that wealth to their citizens. So what are they doing? They're trying to create more wealthy people in the middle class. And that would actually be good for the consumer trends fund because people will more would have better capacity to consume and also this was affected again by the supply chain disruptions but um the supply chains will actually not ease um maybe in the first half but what this fund actually did is that um, they were able to move quickly and they actually invested in actually reopening themes as well, not just um, digital ones. 
So the reopening themes will benefit when people actually to start to come out um, um, and spend on experiences. So you have a balance of both virtual and live um, consumer experiences for, for this fund. So um, eventually this, would, this fund would um, um, recover. All right, thank you very much for that, Kyla. I touch, I liked it that you uh, were able to answer the Global Consumer Feeder Fund, even though we didn't tackle it earlier in this uh, briefing. But of course, props to the friend. And if, and with that, would like to uh, thank our audience that um, all of us here right now are very interested not only on the top performing UITFs of 2021, but also all Ashram products that we cater to. All right. So for the next question is this one is for Migs. Is the Philippine SDG Fund or Sustainable uh, SDG Fund of Atram unique and one of its kind in the market? I think what makes the fund really unique is that Atram really has a scoring process by which we measure the sustainability using SDGs as a common language for sustainability. So I think I mentioned earlier, no, in Atram, the Atram scoring process, our secret sauce to, to be specific, no, it includes the use of non-financial data in evaluating companies. We look at different KPIs, we look at different outcomes uh, from our universe of reviewed companies in each of the SDGs that we review. And so far, it's served to be a very effective framework, a unique and effective framework that uses uh, these KPIs and outcomes to measure sustainability uh, in stock selection, right? So we're sort of doing our own version of fundamental investing by using data, but on the sustainability side. All right. Thank you for that, Migs. And you mentioned that we have our own unique framework that we do not do not only look at the, uh, but, but more of we look also into the use, uh, we not only use the financial data, but for those the non-financial data as well as, you know, um, you mentioned earlier uh, during the first part of your discussion, uh, uh, the outlook or how these companies um, integrate SDG further um, in their own systems and process. So thank you for that, Migs. Um, yeah, and I, the uh, I just wanted to add, JP, no? I mean, you can, you can check the top 10 holdings of the fund now and see how different it is from any other fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that just goes to show, no? Um, what comes out of the, the scoring process itself, right? And it exhibits its uniqueness and effectivity also through that. Yes, I completely agree with that one. And of course, that unique process really propelled our fund, one of uh, the top performing UITFs in the country for 2021. So thank you for that, Amigs. Uh, for the next question, it's for uh, Kyla. For the Global Financial Speeder Fund, how will... It, uh, how will the increase in Fed rates affect this? And what is Atram's strategy? I, knew, I know that you were, you know, gave a little bit of tidbit earlier in this one. Okay, so when, so again, we're in that cycle now of increasing rates. So when the Fed actually increases their rates, um, or actually now it's already happening, um, treasury yields will rise as well. And what are treasury yields? Treasury yields, these are the, um, the U.S. government securities, but globally, these are actually the benchmark rates or the risk-free rates, um, which, are, which, are, which is used as a basis by numerous financial institutions to price their loans. So when you price a loan, you need to put a premium over the risk-free rate. And so when, you, when the risk-free rate increases and then you put your premium on top of that, when you add that together, the, the rates will rise as well. And when the rates rise, um, eventually, that would also mean better revenues for these financial institutions that are charging them. All right. Thanks for that, Kyla. So you touched on when the rates, uh, when these rates rise, um, better financial revenues for those companies. So that's a little bit of a tidbit for those for our audience who uh, who are really invested on uh, the global financial sphere. Uh, for the next question, again, it's addressed to Kyla. Uh, we'll just breeze these questions um, as we are pressed for time. But again, thank you very much for our audience for sending in these questions. It has been a very interactive webinar. So Kyla, um, there has been some new tech funds in the market recently. What makes the Atrium Tech Fund so different uh, from the other banks or asset managers? Okay, 
Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so again, um, for this environment, um, uh, there's a lot of worry now in the technology sector. And what this fund provides for us is, again, that margin of safety, that, that company selection where they choose good valuations, um, where they choose companies that have pricing power to protect those, the investors. And that actually acts as a discount for us already when you're investing. So when the markets are down and you're investing at a low price, the actual um, when the stocks were actually chosen, they already were cheap, uh, cheap uh, to look at to begin with. And something that I didn't mention earlier, but actually this fund has an overlay of ESG factors as well. Um, something that was mentioned by MIGS. So they also actually look at the environmental impact, um, their social impact, and also their governance. So they look at those three factors and just like what he mentioned, sustainability will actually you actually do you well in the long run. So I think that that's what that makes this fun different. Right. Thanks for that, Kyla. And I would just to echo in um, what Kyla and of course Meg has mentioned. Sustainability will actually better for you in the long run. So for the next, actually another follow-up question for you, Kyla, before we, uh, I think this would be our second to the last question before we wrap up our Q&A session. How positive is Atram on global and U.S. tech industry? Given the performance of the global technology feeder, is there still an upside for the short to medium term? Okay, so again, I think I've mentioned the plans for the U.S. and Europe, and those were still actually plans. And so haven't actually translated yet. So when they actually translate, there's still room for the technologies um, sector to, to boom. So I think that's what we can look forward to for that one. Yes, we're very looking forward to that, the booming sector of the technology space right now. Um, they started, the, imagine the height of the pandemic and look at where we are right now. And there's, again, you've mentioned there's still room for growth, which is a positive note that our investors can look into. So for this last question, I will take this last question given we're pressed for time. And this is addressed to the both of you, Kyla and Migs. Of course, we all know that the past performance is not a guarantee of future returns. Of all the funds presented today, which is your personal favorite? So it's not your, which is your personal favorite for 2022? Okay, who will go first? Oh, okay. Uh, go, uh, go. <laughs> Maybe first. Ella, go. You go ahead. Okay. So actually, I also like the fund that Migs presented. Um, so actually, there's a good outlook for the Philippines um, this year. And uh, um, since we saw globally that the, that uh, globally uh, foreign funds have actually benefited, I feel like there's now there's time for or room for us also to continue benefiting as well um, as we reopen. But if you're looking as an investor, you again have to look at what is your time horizon. So for the short term, I think the Philippines or the financials will do well. But if you have a longer um, horizon, I think the technology sector would still um, do well for your portfolio. All right. Thanks for that, Kyla. Migs? Yeah, this is without bias, for sure. Um, but really, I mean, to me, it really is the sustainability, uh, the sustainable, the SDGF. I mean, again, looking at the outlook for the Philippines this year, it's quite good. And we're investing locally here. We're investing in, I think, through our process, uh, we can effectively pick winners also that will capitalize on this uh, good outlook for the Philippines. Um, and it's a good time to invest in the Philippines as well, no? Um, but also, I think, uh, going back to the time horizon side, sustainability, I mean, being able to, so, I mean, it's in the word sustainability, being able to invest in something that you know will create value in the long term um is going to i mean it will play to both those short term and long term horizon goals um in my opinion so this is my favorite this is my favorite for 2022 and beyond all right thank you thank you very much for that kyla it makes great stuff for the both of you and just to echo in on what of course kyla and Migs has mentioned um you both have your uh, personal favorites in to echo also on um uh, mix of uh mix mentioned earlier that invest in the philippines all right so I think that's all the time that we have for questions. I know that I asked lots of questions for you both and uh, for you both, Kyla and Migs. But before we wrap up, do you have any last words for our audience right here, right now? 
um, who listened in and tuned in for the top performing uh, for uh, UITFs for 2021. Again, ladies first. Go, uh, go ahead, Kayla. Okay. Um, so I think uh, now that we're starting 2022 and we're, um, we're towards um, ending that pandemic stage now, and I think things are looking um, so much brighter. So I think it's a good opportunity um, to invest now in both the Philippines and globally. But again, Atrum provides a lot of market updates also. So it, it's be, it, it'll be good also to guide um, to guide you as well um, um, by reading or reading all the, mar the materials and also actually attending these um, webinars so that you'll be guided to manage your portfolio. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good time, especially um, for the Philippines now that we're bouncing, um, bouncing back. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, uh, just want everyone maybe consider taking a look at the SDGF. The SDG fund, no, it's a unique strategy that capitalizes on the recovery and sustainability. It's a good play also long term. So I, I think um, it, it will do you wonders if you, uh, if you can uh, look into the SDGF. And again, as echoing what uh, Kyla has mentioned, no, it's a good time to buy Philippines right now. And I think that recovery uh, coming into play will uh, be a good a good opportunity for you to be able to do so. All right. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Kyla and Migs. And of course, thank you to our audience. We appreciate uh, you for taking the time to join us today. We hope that you were able to gain insights and key takeaways from today's webinar. Now, did you know for as low as 1,000 pesos, you can already jumpstart your investment journey? Here's how you can invest on Atrum funds. Hello. To open an account with Atrum, just visit our website at www.atrum.com.ph. Here, you can learn more about all the funds and services that we offer. Our site will then guide you to our online investment platform, Seedbox, where you can start investing for just 1,000 pesos. But if you have more questions, visit the website's Frequently Asked Questions page or Atrum Academy page. Thank you. Now's the time to create the best version of the life you want in 2022. Join us on our live stream next week, that's on February 18 at 7 p.m. for Atrum Friday Conversations as we tackle how you can achieve your goals this 2022. Of course, with our special guest, Zara Carbonell, the founder of Social Startup. Join the live stream event by scanning the QR code, or you may also visit um, our official Facebook page and YouTube channel. If you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unable to attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session. And of course, visit our YouTube channel that's at Atrum Studio. Please scan the QR code to visit our official social media pages. Maybe we can give a few seconds uh, for our audience to whip up their phones and scan the QR code found on their screens so that they can join us and visit all our official social media pages. Also, I would like to invite you to join Atrum's official Viber community group. That's hashtag AtramPHCommunity to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. You may do so by scanning the QR code or visit the link on your screen and get a chance to win Atrum merchandise. Lastly, please answer the survey at the end of this webinar. We'd love to know your thoughts on today's topic. On behalf of everyone here at Atram, thank you very much again for your attendance and participation. Wish you and your loved ones continued health and safety. Have a great day, everyone.